Good afternoon and welcome to this virtual Commonwealth Club Humanities Forum. I'm Carla Marinucci, Senior Writer for Politico's California Playbook, and I'm your moderator for today. Presently, the Commonwealth Club has suspended its in-person programming and it's hosting virtual special events like this one. Visit our website at www.commonwealthclub.org to learn more about our upcoming events or about becoming a member. Our thanks to George Hammond for helping to coordinate today's program. And now it is my pleasure to introduce Molly Ball, the national political correspondent with Time and the author of the fascinating new bio, Pelosi. Molly is a CNN political analyst, has written for numerous publications, including The Atlantic and Politico. And over the course of her career, Molly has earned many journalism awards, including the Gerald R. Ford Journalism Prize and the Toner Prize for Excellence in Political Reporting. A graduate of Yale University, Molly was a Knight Wallace Journalism Fellow at the University of Michigan, where she studied economic policy. Please join me in welcoming Molly Ball. Molly, such a pleasure to share this forum with you today. Welcome. <laughs> thank you, Carla. Thank you for that uh, amazingly <laughs> generous introduction. And thank you so much for having me here today. It's great to virtually uh, be in the Bay Area. <laughs> look, I mean, this book is a real fresh look at a woman who in our lifetime has become one of the most powerful women on the planet. You posed the question right from the start. How did an Italian grandmother in heels manage to become uh, the most effective legislator since LBJ? And you start in the book by taking us all the way back to Nancy Pelosi's Italian immigrant roots. So let's go there. Let's start there. We've got some pictures up to illustrate this. Her mother, a Southern Italian immigrant, Annunziata Lombardi, and her father, this brash uh, Italian-American politician, Tommy D'Alessandro, congressman and later mayor of Baltimore, and Nancy, the youngest, with five older brothers, uh, the brothers are groomed to go into politics. Nancy, your book says, was groomed to be a nun. Um, talk a little bit about how her mother, Annunziata, um, taught her the kind of skills that would end up shaping her later in life. She learned at the knee of Big Nancy, did she not? <laughs> She did. You know, I started I started this book with her mother, and that was very intentional on my part. You know, there's so much attention has been paid to her father and the political heritage that she came from. And that makes sense. Her father had the title in front of his name. He was a congressman. He was the mayor. Uh, and she obviously went into the family business in a sense. Uh, but from the very first time I, I interviewed Nancy Pelosi two, more than two years ago for a profile in Time magazine, she was always uh, careful to to highlight her mother's contributions to what she really describes as a family political enterprise. And I think you see this in a lot of political families, right? That the, the politician is just sort of the face of, a, of, of a whole, the whole family's political career. And that was very much the case. And, and uh, Nancy Pelosi and her brothers described her their mother as a real politician in the family. She uh, maintained the the favor file, which was sort of the constituent services operation that they ran out of the parlor of their uh, their row house in Baltimore's Little Italy, where she grew up. Uh, she ran the Baltimore Women's Democratic Club from the basement. That they were responsible for a lot of the uh, get out the vote operation when election time rolled around, precinct by precinct, block by block, turning out all of the uh, the mayor supporters uh, to to vote for him and keep him the mayor of Baltimore. Uh, and she also had a very uh, assertive personality. There's there are stories about how she um, she once took LBJ to task to his face, echoes of you know her daughter's interactions with uh, with later presidents, <laughs> perhaps. Right. Uh, she supposedly once once pu punched a poll worker in the face who had uh, gotten on her back bad side. So you know, I think Nancy Pelosi is very much uh, her toughness is legendary. She's someone who's never been afraid to get in people's faces, despite being raised as a sort of you know polite 1940s uh, Catholic schoolgirl. Uh, and so I think she gets a lot of that personality from her mother. But she also learned from her mother, and she's very frank about this too. Uh, she saw the ways that her mother was limited in her life by being a woman. Her mother wanted to go to law school. She wanted to be an auctioneer. She wanted to start a business. She wanted to make investments. Uh, but in those days, you needed a man's name on the check 
you know, a man's signature in order to make those kinds of investments and her husband wouldn't give it to her. So as she grew up, uh, young Nancy D'Alessandro, uh, little Nancy as it were, uh, she was very mindful of this. She saw the ways that being a woman uh, created limitations for her mother and that really shaped her a lot too as she forged her way in the world uh, being a woman and eventually you know breaking a lot of barriers as the first woman to, to lead a party in Congress. But her father too I mean we, you have photos in the book show uh, little Nancy there at the podium when her father sworn in as mayor of Baltimore. She also learned a lot of the skills of political organizing even as a young girl is that correct by watching dad and the brothers as well. Yeah, absolutely. And and I think it's almost a perfect metaphor for the evolution of the Democratic Party, right? Nancy Pelosi coming from that sort of old school, urban, white ethnic, democratic machine politics of Baltimore in the 40s and 50s. And then fast forward to today, she's the face of a Democratic Party that is increasingly concentrated in uh, coastal enclaves, places like San Francisco, uh, among, you know, sort of moneyed elites like, like the Pelosi family. Uh, so it is a, a, a trajectory that I think says a lot about uh, how the party has traveled over the course of her lifetime. And she's done a lot to shape that. Uh, but her father, absolutely, you know, he was very much about that kind of ground level politics. Uh, his his namesake son, Nancy Pelosi's oldest brother, who also went on to be mayor, he described this kind of politics, I love this phrase, he called it human nature in the raw, because <laughs> you know every one of your constituents, you know exactly what they want and they need from you, and it's very, and, and you're face to face with them every day, hearing their complaints, you know, they would call up that, that favor file that was run out of the parlor, Nancy Pelosi started being responsible for it from the time she was about 11. So people would come in, you know, during the depression when they were hungry, they would come in because they needed to get into the public hospital or get on welfare or get a job in city government. And so it was a very sort of tactile, personal, ground level type of politics. And, and she really retains that, that lens on political organizing today. But you know that even as a young woman, young Catholic woman, Italian American growing up in Baltimore, she wasn't always a feminist. You, you had an anecdote in the book writing about how when she attended the March on Washington, she left before Martin Luther King delivered the famous I have a dream speech. Why, Molly? <laughs> she was getting ready for her wedding in uh, the fall of 1963. She had just graduated from college and she was about to marry uh, Paul Pelosi. So she did attend the March on Washington. Uh, but she left before MLK spoke because she was getting ready to get married. <laughs> and, you know, married straight out of college. She was that dutiful Catholic housewife. She moved to San Francisco to support her husband's career. Uh, and then she proceeded to have five kids in six years. Um, when, did, when did, talk about that a little bit about how she, how the passion for politics developed while she's dealing with this horde <laughs> of toddlers in the, in the house. Well, uh, as a mother of three, I definitely relate to the idea that running, that, that dealing with small children is itself a sort of political enterprise, right? You're always managing the sort of shifting coalitions of a, of a, a team of rivals, as it were. Uh, but, uh, but, you know, she was literally born into the Democratic Party, and her family had very strong allegiances to the church, to the party, and, and, and to the country. And so it was really sort of in her blood to be a Democrat. And that was always the vehicle for whatever activism that she did. So, you know, in the 60s and 70s, people are out there burning their draft cards, people are marching for all kinds of causes. Uh, and she was mostly a party activist. She was, you know, they lived in New York before moving to San Francisco. She tells stories about walking around, you know, ginormously pregnant with another little kid in the stroller and slipping uh, democratic leaflets under the doors of the apartments near theirs in, in midtown Manhattan. Uh, so that was, she really became a party operative. And when she moved to California, became a legendary Democratic fundraiser, hosting um, when they lived in the Presidio Terrace, uh, they had this big house and they started hosting Democratic fundraisers. She quickly uh, showed that she had a talent for getting people to, to give money to Democratic politicians. Uh, so it became a stop, on, not just on the California fundraising circuit, but on the national fundraising circuit. And it was through that work that she got to know a lot of political players, uh, Leo McCarthy, Phil Burton, Jerry Brown. Uh, and through her relationships with them, 
uh, and her and her volunteer activities in the city, uh, she sort of entered politics that way. Her brother-in-law was a Democratic member of the San Francisco Board of Supervisors, uh, Paul Pelosi's older brother, uh, and um, and so she was also sort of inducted into uh, Democratic power networks that way. Uh, but the very first sort of official position that she ever had was when in 1975, then Mayor Joe Alioto named her to the San Francisco Public Library Commission. So yes. she sort of, and I think this is also common for a lot of women who get into politics. They come in as a volunteer because so much of women's labor is volunteer work, whether it's, you know, advocating for their child who has special needs in elementary school or, or you know, volunteering with the local food bank or church or whatever. So it was through volunteering to the library that she then became uh, unofficial for the first time. I, I love the anecdote in the book. You have uh, Mayor Aliota called her up and said, uh, are you cooking pasta fagioli uh, today? And she said, no, I'm reading the New York Times, even with all the kids. She, your point being, she was underestimated even then. She was stereotyped even then. And she didn't like it, correct? She was. And I love that story um, because of the way she tells it. She's, she described that to me as she immediately reacted to that as, oh, this this terrible old chauvinist is, you know, stereotyping me as, as, as you know, <laughs> yeah. a, a housewife slaving over a hot stove. Uh, <laughs> But then the next part of their conversation was when he asked her to be on the board and she said, oh, I don't need an official position. I'm glad to be a volunteer. I'll help however I can. And he took her to task for that. He said, if you're doing the work, you should have the authority that you deserve. And that was a wake up call for her that really opened her eyes to, uh, I think, uh, an, an insight about hard power, right? Because as a woman in 1975, nobody necessarily listened to her when she opened her mouth, but when she had a vote they had to listen. And that is, to this day, the way she operates is if you have the votes, people have to respect you, they have to listen to you, they have to take you seriously, whether or not they are inclined to based on your appearance and your profile. You, you make the point in the book too that the art of raising five children also gave her uh, a number of skills, the, a mantra that she had with the children, Proper preparation prevents poor performance, which seems to be that, that seems to be the, the absolute motto for Nancy. Life Lowe. motto, yeah. <laughs> but also cooperation, not gossip. I mean, there were a lot of the skills she developed in dealing with that army that, that she still uses today, it seems like. Am I, is that Absolutely, correct? and she talks about it that way too. You know, this isn't me projecting. Um, and I, and, but I think, you know, again, there's been too little emphasis in uh, descriptions of her career on the skills that she learned as a parent because she really describes those as formative. I think anyone who's, who's been a parent uh, can relate to that feeling, uh, you know, when you're entering the sort of new frontiers of sleeplessness uh, phase of infancy and you realize you're just capable of so much more than you thought. And that's the way she described it to me was this, uh, this realization of her capacity being expanded. But then the way she ran that household, you know, having five kids who were all extremely close in age, uh, but they all folded their own laundry. They all made their <laughs> own lunches for school. They cleared the table from dinner and they set the table for breakfast right after before yeah. they went to bed. So this is a woman who clearly uh, had some skills at, at, at organizing uh, large numbers of, of unruly people. And you know, the phrase that you, you've probably heard her say it, that she uses uh, constantly with the House Democrats is our diversity is our strength, but our unity is our power. And, you, mm -hmm. and I think that that also comes from that experience in the house, household, right? Because everybody's got a different temperament. Everybody's got different priorities and things that they want. Uh, but people have, but they have to realize the importance of working together if you're going to get anywhere, even if it's just, you know, getting everyone to put their shoes on and get out the door. Yeah, yeah. One of the Californians who really saw the talent, the skills that Nancy Pelosi had in the early years was Jerry Brown. Um, you know, what, what did he see in her back in those days? What was it? Tell us a little bit about the relationship that really officially launched her career in politics when she became chair of the California State Democratic Party. Yeah, well, she had gotten to know Jerry Brown a little bit when he was the young governor and she was a Democratic fundraiser. And uh, But then in 1976, when Jerry Brown decided to run for president, uh, he got in the race very late. It was mathematically impossible for him to actually get enough delegates to win, but he thought he could sort of sweep into the convention with momentum after a favorite son win in the California primary. 
Well, she thought that that strategy was flawed. She thought that would be too late. And she thought that she could help him with her family connections win the Democratic primary in Maryland. Uh, so she wrote a memo. She had uh, Leo McCarthy, I believe, give it to Jerry Brown. And he decided it was worth a try. So he camped out in Baltimore. He he stayed with uh, her brothers. And uh, and he went on you know, a speaking tour where people describe, I wasn't there, but people describe a sort of Obama-like sensation, right, of these crowds of young people flocking to these soaring speeches. Uh, and when he won the Maryland primary, it, it stunned people and sort of established him as a force in that race. Now, of course, he did not win. Uh, but when he got up there on the and gave his victory speech and called Nancy Pelosi the architect of that primary victory, that sort of established her as a as a strategist, as a and, and that's how she saw herself. She didn't think she would ever run for office, uh, but she wanted to be that kind of behind the scenes operative. And uh, and, and so from then that actually Jerry Brown wanted her to run for California Democratic Party chair right away. She said, I've never even been to a central committee meeting. Uh, but she agreed to be Northern California chair and then a couple of years later became chair of the largest Democratic Party in the country. She she made an unsuccessful run for the DNC chair in 1984. You mentioned uh, a, a headline she took from the San Francisco Examiner, can a 42-year-old mother of five with an Italian name from ultra-liberal San Francisco per persuade the good old boys that she can run the Democratic Party? And a lot of Democrats at that time said no. They wanted a man in the job. Uh, you're, you write that this was one of the hardest races she ever ran, still facing prejudice at that time. Uh, you know, what did that teach her as she went forward and then is eventually decided to run for Congress uh, at, at age 47? Yeah, I mean, she describes that race as having sort of taught her about the rough and tumble uh, nature of politics. And also, as you mentioned, the, the unfairness of uh, being a woman in politics. Uh, you know, the, the biggest sort of blow up of that contest was when uh, she heard through through the grapevine that an official with the AFL-CIO had described her as an airhead. And this incensed her. And she went off on him in front of a group of reporters. And there was a public controversy over it. Um, but, you know, she sort of, she sensed the coded sexism and people saying things like, oh, we need somebody strong to stand up to Reagan. She, What she heard from that was, oh, we need a man. It also, you know, coming right after the 1984 convention uh, uh, election, when she uh, was instrumental in bringing the Democratic Convention to San Francisco, the origins of the whole San Francisco Democrats idea. Um, but, uh, you know, people said, well, the Democrats are going to have a Geraldine Ferraro problem if they put another, uh, you know, Italian liberal woman in charge of the party. And so that was a strike against her as well. So, uh, so I think she took all of that experience to heart when she got into the uh, rough and tumble game of politics herself. And that was, uh, we got a picture up of the slogan, Nancy Pelosi, a voice that will be heard. Um, that she, her, her decision to run uh, was of course so important. She had uh, Phil Burton before him and then Sala Burton uh, on her deathbed urging Nancy Pelosi to run. It was something she said she never wanted to do, run for public office. What made her make the jump at age 47 and did she still think about motherhood and, and that being an issue in her life at that time? Yeah, um, you know, she to this day talks about herself as sort of an accidental politician, someone who never planned to, to get into electoral politics. I was very skeptical of this. And it seemed weird to me also because you know, she's a very vocal advocate for women owning their ambition and, and not shying away from, uh, from, from wanting to achieve power in their lives. Uh, but there are actually multiple points in, over the course of her career as, a, as an operative and fundraiser where people urged her to run for office. You know, she shared she chaired the Democratic Senate uh, Committee's finance operation in 1986. And uh, George Mitchell uh, told her she should run for, for governor or for mayor. And she yeah. said, no, I'm not interested. It was only when uh, Sala Burton, then congresswoman who had in, sort of inherited her, her husband, Phil Burton's seat in Congress when he died, uh, extracted this deathbed promise, which again, it's sort of so cinematic, it doesn't seem like it could possibly be real, but there are witnesses uh, who confirm that this is actually uh, what happened. And um, you know, Sala was dying of cancer and she told her friend, Nancy Pelosi, she wanted her to run for the seat. Nancy Pelosi gave her promise. And then uh, it, there was a very hard fought race, a 14 way race That's for right. that, uh, that congressional seat representing San Francisco. I mean, uh, it doesn't she was open very often. 
uh, obviously, uh, and 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 she won by by a thin margin. Um, but uh, and that was the slogan: a voice that will be heard. And and one of her campaign consultants, uh, when when they came up with this, said, "Wait a minute, you're going to run a 47 year old housewife who, who's never held office as someone who can be influential yeah. and effective." Uh, he's, yep, that's what we're gonna do, and so uh, that was very much her platform. But the, but you know, her at that point, four of her five children had already left the house, and her oldest uh, was about to, her youngest, sorry, uh, Alexander was about to graduate from high school, and so she went to Alexander and she said, "Mommy has a chance to run for Congress, but if you don't want me to, I won't do it." And with in like perfect, you know, rebellious teenage girl fashion, Alexandra rolled her eyes and said, "Mom." get a life. <laughs> so she took that as permission uh, to go ahead and do the race. But it interest, it's interesting because she she never had the experience that uh, that a lot of people in my generation have of balancing work and, and, and home. I mean, she certainly was a very active, you know, player in the, in the party, was doing a lot of things besides uh, being a housewife during the time her kids were little. But she didn't quite have that experience of, of being, uh, being a working mom in the way that a lot of people do today. Yeah, uh, Phil Burton um, described her many skills, uh, uh, and but said that of, all, over everything else, she was operational. Um, what what did that mean? What does that mean? Uh, I think that you said that that is a perfect description of of how she operates in politics. Absolutely, I think that's the best uh, sort of adjective to attach to Nancy Pelosi because and what what Phil Burton meant by that it was sort of his highest term of praise. And what he meant was she's focused on results. She gets things done. She's not out there to showboat or to hear herself talk or have people, you know, look at her admiringly. She's out there to accomplish things. And if you look over the career of Nancy Pelosi, you know, uh, there, there's so many episodes where she put results ahead of everything else, ahead of her image, ahead of, you know, what people thought of her, ahead of whatever. Uh, because she she is operational, she's very much an instrumentalist, and that was what Phil you know Phil Burton was this like legendarily rough around the edges sort of you know vulgar hard fighting crusading progressive, uh, you, and uh, you know he one of my favorite quotes he said the only way to deal with exploiters is to terrorize the bastards, uh, so he might have seen you know her and her banker husband with their big house in Presidio Terrace Terrace as members of that exploiter class, but she impressed him from the beginning because she was willing to stand up to him and because she was focused on getting things done. Um, I mean, talk a little bit about the qualities that served her up there on Capitol Hill. Among them being, you know, her being known far and wide as an energizer bunny, that in terms of fundraising and everything else. But everyone talks about her ability to count the votes. Um, her ability to remember every constituent. Uh, she said, she said, you point them out in the book, she says, being a representative, that's what it is about, representing, that is your job. Is that what distinguished her in the beginning? Uh, I, I, just talk a little bit about her, those skills. Yeah, well, because of her background as a fundraiser, she came to Congress extremely well-connected, right? She had, she estimated that she already knew 200 senators and members of Congress. Uh, okay, personally. You, point out, you point out, I'm sorry, that she became the first daughter in history to succeed her father in Congress among among many of the landmarks. Correct? That's right. Although yeah. although she did it, you know, without being able to to use the D'Alessandro name and in a place, you know, three 3,000 miles from Baltimore. Um, but, uh, but, you know, so she was very well connected when she first got there. She was determined above all to advocate uh, for victims of the AIDS crisis, which was ravaging San Francisco at the time. Her primary opponent in that in the congressional race uh, was, you know, a, was the sort of heir to Harvey Milk, who wanted to be the first openly gay representative in Congress. Uh, and part of what she had promised her district was, I will advocate for this community despite not being a member of it. And she took that very seriously. Uh, but the interesting thing I thought about her early years in Congress, uh, in addition to the issues she was passionate about, is that she did focus mainly on the issues. She did not start climbing that leadership ladder or, or, or you know, immediately start to think, okay, how can I get into, you know, uh, the, the, the deputy vice chair of the caucus and then sort of work my way up. Uh, she was focused on getting onto the most interesting committees, the committees that did the most important work. She uh, failed in her first run to get on the appropriations committee. She succeeded the 
The second time she uh, served on the ethics, uh, the intel, she's still the longest serving member of the intelligence committee. Uh, so, so she really focused on, and, and this was also a piece of advice from her older brother, Tommy, who said it's very hard for them to diminish you if you know what you're talking about. And I think you see this with a lot of women who get into positions of power. They prepare to a maniacal degree because, again, they know that they won't necessarily be taken seriously when they walk into a room. They can't necessarily sort of coast on on uh, glib uh, arrogance and have people assume that they know what they're talking about the way some men are able to do. Uh, so she was always, uh, as you say, she had this tremendous level of energy. Her staff from the beginning uh, was amazed that by how, you know, how consumed she was by her work, how she hardly seemed to eat and never seemed to sleep. Uh, but she really focused on, on doing the work and knowing all of the issues. And so that, and so when she did a decade later, uh, make a bid for a top leadership position, she had earned people's respect as somebody who, who knew the substance. And, and of course, I mean, she's renowned for knowing how to keep this often rebellious caucus in line, um, herding the cats, as they say. Uh, some of those are mommy techniques you point out. Um, the ability to be disappointed in people, uh, but not go off on them. It, that, that contributed to some of that power. In fact, you mentioned that her mantra has been, know thy power. That was, some, yeah. And that was something that uh, former Congresswoman Lindy Boggs uh, said to her at one point. Uh, they were, it was, it was around the time of the 84 convention and, and Nancy Pelosi was worried she was taking on too many roles, too many different, you know, committees and so on. And, uh, and Lindy Boggs said to her in her, her Southern accent, Nancy, know thy power. Uh, and that became the name of her memoir. It's a lesson that she all, often tries to impart, particularly to, to young women who she's trying to get to run for office. Uh, and and it's very much, as you said, reflected in the way she runs the House. You have to know where the votes are if you're going to get anything done. And you can see this, this exasperation that she has for anyone who's more interested in sort of debating the finer points of, of what ought to be, uh, because if you don't have the votes, all of that is meaningless, at least if you're Nancy Pelosi. Yeah. Uh, we got a lot of questions on a, a current, what's going on currently with her and Trump, and I want to get to those. Uh, one of the questions that kept coming in is, what surprised you most about writing this book with regard to Pelosi? You know, there were a lot of things that that, that I found surprising, but something that I, I, I mentioned earlier, just her ability, her her willingness to get in people's faces, uh, her her aggressiveness, which really, you know, for for someone raised to be a nun, uh, is is a pretty surprising uh, sort of innate characteristic. You know, this is someone who uh, went to Tiananmen Square in 1991 and right. defied Chinese authorities to protest on behalf of human rights and democracy, chased out of the square by the Chinese police, uh, having, you know, sneaked out of her hotel room with a couple of other congressmen, uh, one of whom, uh, fun fact, played Cooter on the Dukes of Hazard. I just love <laughs> that detail. Uh, went on to be a Democratic congressman. Uh, but so, and, you know, she took on the, the male power structure to, to run for House leadership and become the first woman to, to lead a party in Congress. She was very against the Iraq war at a time when a lot of top Democrats, including Hillary Clinton uh, and, and other and, and the leader of the House, Dick Gephardt, um, a lot of Democrats thought that this was political poison and they needed to see, to be seen, you know, standing by George W. Bush, the wartime president. Uh, she believed, as having seen a lot of the classified intelligence from her perch as top Democrat on the Intelligence Committee, she didn't think that the case for war was solid, and she thought that the war was a bad idea, and she actually whipped her colleagues against their own leadership uh, and got a majority of the House Democrats to vote against uh, the war resolution. Uh, so, so this is someone who, 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 you know, that steel spine that people always talk about her having, she, I think she was born with that, and she you know, from, from, from Phil Burton to Donald Trump has always been willing to, to stand up to people, to interrupt them, to, 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 to know her own power and to make sure that, that no one else uh, tries to speak for her. You know, the, the, that image that's on the cover of my book, that famous meme of her yeah. walking out of that meeting with Trump, the reason that became such a sensation was because of what happened inside the room when you know, Trump tried to say, oh, Nancy can't talk right now. She's in a tough situation with her caucus. And she interrupted him, yeah. put her hand in his face, as she often does. I, she, she once said that uh, she knows people think it's rude to point, but she just can't help it. It's just the way she is. 
and, um, and, and, and said to him, Mr. President, please don't characterize the strength that I bring to this meeting as the leader of the House Democrats who just won a big victory. And it was that moment that I think, you know, a lot of liberals and Democrats and particularly liberal women who were the, whose, whose activism and voting and candidacy was the engine of that Democratic victory in 2018, uh, for a lot of those people, that was really exciting to hear someone, especially a powerful woman, stand up to Trump in that way. And that was what made that image really go viral. That was an iconic moment. Uh, so was the moment when she became Speaker of the House, surrounded by all those children, including her grandchildren. Uh, I, think, I think a lot of women saw that as one of the moments to always remember. Uh, I, mean, I want to talk a little bit about her relationship with Barack Obama during those years, passing the ACA, the Affordable Care Act. You, you point out in the book that Obama's given a lot of credit for that, John McCain, of course, but Pelosi was in many ways the, the heavy lifter who got that over the finish line and, and, and was never really given enough credit. Do you think, I mean, talk about the fight that she put on and, the, and how much muscle she put into uh, passing that Affordable Care Act. Well, if I could just go back for a second to the image that you mentioned um, of her becoming speaker surrounded by children, I think that's a really interesting aspect of her persona too, right? Because you see a lot of uh, powerful and barrier breaking women try to downplay their family life, downplay their femininity, right? Try to almost impersonate a man because that's our conventional image of what power looks like. So, you know, whether it's Hillary Clinton in 2008, sort of imitating the, 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 the Margaret Thatcher playbook of, of, of strength and hawkishness, um, or a lot of you know, women I know who, who came of age in, in earlier times and, and, and wouldn't even admit that they had children because they thought they'd be pushed aside at work. Uh, she never did, she always foregrounded her family. She always cited her family as the reason she got into politics. She always, and, and so I think that that image is really unique to her. There, there, are, there were no role models for her as a woman speaker of the house because no one had ever done it before. But she really, I think, cut an image of uh, female and, and feminine power in a way that is uh, unique for, for, for women in politics. Um, so the ACA is uh, her proudest achievement. She hopes it will be her legacy, something Democratic presidents have been trying to achieve for a hundred years and they were finally able to get it done. And I think most people, including Barack Obama, would agree that it would not have gotten done without Speaker Pelosi being in charge of the Democratic caucus from the, from getting, you know, getting all the votes for it among the Democratic caucus with nary a vote to spare with this very ideologically diverse, uh, geographically, demographically diverse Democratic majority that they had at that time, 2009, 2010. And then also, you know, when the Democrats lost their 60th Senate vote uh, in January 2010, and a lot of people wanted to give up. Rahm Emanuel, the White House chief of staff, other political advisors of the president, Obama in some interviews, he, he denies it now, but seemed to be going wobbly a little bit. Uh, and it was Nancy Pelosi who, at, an, at a meeting in the Oval Office, you can almost imagine her putting her finger in his face, although I don't know that that <laughs> was the case, um, saying, Mr. President, I know people are urging you to take, she called it the namby-pamby approach, uh, <laughs> but we've come too far to stop now. And he agreed with her, he took her side, and then everyone thought it was impossible for her to, to get that Senate bill through the House and do the, the whole reconciliation two-step that they did. Uh, she got it done and, uh, and against the odds. And uh, again, I think that a lot of people today would agree that, that it wouldn't have gotten done if she hadn't been there. There were a lot of dark years after she won the speakership and lost when the Democrats lost the House. And you point out how that is when Republicans turned and made her the target of, uh, of, of all their anger and their political operations. They raised money against her, the San Francisco Democrat. There was a whole campaign, firenancypelosi.com. How, how did she um, sustain those kind of attacks? Many of them incredibly personal, dealing with, uh, with her dress, her physical appearance, etc. But she has weathered it all. She seems to brush it all off. How, how, how has she done that? You know, from the very beginning of her being involved in politics, she's never wanted to hear about people's negative opinions of her. She'd say, don't tell me about that. Go out and help the cause. Go out and do more organizing, raise more money, get more votes. Um, and, and that is her attitude. Uh, she is, she just has a very thick skin for this stuff, you know, starting in, well, it started a little bit earlier, but really starting in earnest in 2010 when the Republicans 
won the house back. They spent tens of millions of dollars every cycle, hundreds of millions of dollars in total on ads associating congressional candidates all over the country with the image of Nancy Pelosi and the idea of San Francisco values, uh, which Nancy Pelosi believes is essentially a homophobic dog whistle. She believes that when Republicans say San Francisco values, what they're saying is gay rights. Um, and, uh, and, and so, you know, she never, she never seemed to take it personally. And, um, and she always, like you said, sort of let it roll off her. Uh, when you ask her about it, as I have and others have, she says, well, if I weren't effective, I wouldn't be a target. Uh, but there is clearly something, and I'm not saying any of this is unfair, right? She's not the first congressional leader, uh, to be attacked on a national right. scale. Uh, and, uh, and politics ain't beanbag. We all know that. Uh, in fact, it was quite true, it, quite a, it, it was quite warranted for Republicans to say to constituents of, you know, a conservative Democrat in North Carolina, well, you know, when you vote for this person, you're really voting for Nancy Pelosi, the San Francisco liberal, to be Speaker of the House. That's true. And politics has become increasingly nationalized over the decades she's been in politics. Uh, but it is an unprecedented onslaught. And there's clearly something visceral about it, right? It clearly is about more than just policy. The reason Republicans have kept doubling down on this attack is that they could see that just bringing up her name got under people's skin. The Republican-based voters just got angry when you even mention Nancy Pelosi. There's something about her that just really fired up the Republican base and got them out to vote. Something something much more intangible than just, oh, you know, here are her, her, here are her extreme liberal policy positions. Uh, and so, you know, she would not have been able to survive if she didn't have that ability to, to sort of shut out on all the noise and, and focus on her job running the House and running the Democratic caucus. Um, but, uh, but I do think that at some point she did start to see that it was a liability uh, for the party and something that had to be dealt with, not in order to save her own ego, uh, but for her to be able to keep the speakership and, and be effective once she started getting challenged for, for leadership in, in 2016 and 2018. Yeah, and I, I find that, that she went through issues with her own party. She took attacks from her own party on her age, on whether she had had her day, and yet she decided to hang in there. Um, what what kept her, what, what fired her to keep going, to, to hang in there, despite she was getting a lot of heat from some of the progressives in her own party and challenges, as you mentioned. I mean, it, that was a key moment in her career. Yeah, well, she would certainly point out, and I don't speak for her, but she, she would certainly point out that she never had less than uh, two thirds of the support of the caucus. So even at her lowest moment when she lost 63 votes to Tim Ryan after 2016, uh, she's still, she's always commanded the loyalty of a solid majority of the Democratic caucus. But yeah, there was a lot of angst about her leadership. The whole leadership team, her, Steny Hoyer, Jim Clyburn, having been there for 15 plus years, it had kind of frozen the Democratic caucus in place so ambitious younger members can't move up. And that's frustrating for a lot of people who want to have their own glorious political careers in the House. Um and, and so, you know, there was a lot of angst about her inside the party. Uh, and she did stay on when a lot of people expected her to leave, but especially after losing the House in 2010. You know, she's a, she, she would always say that she had to protect the Affordable Care Act. That was her primary mission. And the reason she stayed, she couldn't allow uh, the Republican majority to, to roll it back, to repeal it. Uh, and, and she's clearly a, a very persistent, uh, not to say stubborn human being. <laughs> Uh, but one of her former aides uh, described her to me in a way that has really stuck with me. She's, he said, he said, everything she does is rooted in this combination uh, of obligation and confidence. You could call it entitlement even uh, that, you know, she looks at a situation and she thinks, well, somebody's got to do something. And then she looks around and she says, and I'm the best one to do it. Nobody else can do this as well as, as me. Okay. Uh, and so, uh, and so repeatedly on, 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 on occasion after occasion, she's looked around and said, well, someone's got to do this and I'm the one who, who has to do it. Uh, and so, you know, in 2018, uh, or sorry, in 2016, uh, she has told me and others that, that she would have considered, uh, stepping down if Hillary Clinton had won, uh, because there would be a woman at the table, but without, but when Trump won, she felt that a, someone strong had to be in there to save the Affordable Care Act. She was not able to prevent it from, to prevent the repeal from passing the House, but she uh, was involved in a lot of the activism that helped ensure that it was defeated in the Senate. Um, and, 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 uh, and also just, you know, the, the holding the Democrats together, 
making sure that leading them back to victory. She, despite the years of losses, was confident she could do that based in part on her uh, taking back the house in 2006. Uh, and so for all of those reasons, uh, she felt that she had to stay. And, and, you know, it is important to her that women are represented. It really, she talks about, you know, ever since she got into leadership, uh, starting in 2005, walking into the White House when George W. Bush was president, sitting down with the rest of the congressional leadership and realizing for more than 200 years, everyone in this discussion has been a man. And without her, to this day, there would not be a woman at that negotiating table. So I think that really is important to her. Absolutely. And, and let's talk about her relationship with Donald Trump. It is, it's so interesting to, to recall that, it, as you know, in the beginning, he showed a lot of respect for her. He even tweeted his support for her as speaker the second time around. What happened to this relationship in that, you know, he's now ramped it up. He's calling her crazy, a sick woman with mental problems. It's, it's now beyond anything we've seen. Uh, talk a little bit about the relationship. And we're showing the picture right now of the famous clap. And that was her applauding after his uh, State of the Union address that she had delayed during the government shutdown when she yes. informed the president that she, that she would not be inviting him to give his State of the Union to the House chamber while the government was still shut down and she famously won that standoff. So I think in that interaction and others, she has clearly had an ability to get under his skin and to dominate him in a way that other political figures have not managed to do. And if there's anything that we know about this president, it's that he respects strength above all, he respects dominance. And so he has always had a sort of grudging respect for her and she has always had the ability to stand up to him, to get in his face, to get under his skin. Uh, they now have not spoken in many months. He, uh, his feelings were hurt by the impeachment drive, among other things, and he has essentially frozen her out. However, she does still have a good working relationship with others in the administration, especially the, the Treasury Secretary Mnuchin, who she's worked with to negotiate these multi-trillion dollar coronavirus response packages. Again, she's operational, she's cold-blooded, she'll get in that negotiation if, it, if she thinks she can achieve a result, no matter what kind of names people are calling her. Uh, but, but the president doesn't seem to have that ability to sort of separate the, 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 the personal and political. He, uh, he informed her very early on that as long as they were investigating him, he couldn't, he couldn't engage in any other discussions on policy or anything else. Right, we've got a couple of questions on this. I mean, in terms of her getting under his skin, she seems to have managed in, in, a, in a very precise way, uh, morbid obesity, uh, to talk about how she prays for the president. He seems to really rankle at, that, at those uh, responses. Are those, are those absolutely calculated or is that uh, Pelosi being mommy <laughs> to, to, the five, to the five unruly children? Yeah, no, I think that's, I think she's just, telling us how she really feels. You know, a lot of people have asked me about that moment where she ripped up the, the speech after the most recent State of the Union, and did she plan that? All of my reporting and, and my instincts tell me that that was an absolutely spontaneous display of what she really felt. You know, she, she didn't like the speech, she believed it was full of falsehoods, but also the spectacle of it, right? She's an institutionalist. The president was on her turf, she invited by the House caucus to speak in their chamber, and he proceeds to stage this sort of campaign rally type display, giving Medal of Freedom to Rush Limbaugh right on the spot and all this stuff. So I think she felt on some level like he was defiling the House chamber. And as an institutionalist, you know, it's she is someone who spent her life in institutions, the Catholic Church, the Democratic Party, the Congress, all these sort of highly regimented formal institutions. And Trump is the opposite of all that, like it or, or not. Uh, yeah. and, and so, you know, he's given her a foil, clearly. I think that she has benefited from that contrast between the two of them. Um, but he really, I, I, think it, I think it does bother her that he has so little respect for those institutions that she's devoted her life to. She won't admit that he bothers her on any level. She, she'll just say, well, I don't have time for that. Uh, <laughs> he is what he is and let's focus on what we can do. We're, we're looking at the picture, the other iconic picture of her in, a, in the cabinet meeting, I think it is, where she basically uh, speaks, just stands up and challenges him. I, I believe he was kind of insulting her in that meeting, am I right? Uh, this moment, and another one that stands out in her career. Yeah, well, actually she was insulting him. Uh, she started. <laughs> <laughs> so, but this, this, I love the story of this picture. 
uh, because this was another one that, you know, in our current social media age uh, has been memefied. And, and, but the only reason we even have this picture, this was a, a, a closed door meeting uh, on, on Syria policy in, in the White House. Uh, and, uh, and it was after she uh, got in her space and then stormed out of the meeting that, that the president, a White House photographer took this picture and the president posted it on Twitter to accuse her of having had a meltdown. And everybody, oh, not everybody, but a lot of particularly Democrats uh, loved this image, loved that image of her being the only woman in this room full of men and everybody else is listening to the president rant and rave and sort of just like staring at their notes. And she's the one who stand, literally stands up, literally puts her finger in his face. And what she said she was saying to him at that moment that caused him to insult her in a way that made her storm out of the meeting. He was, he was, she was saying to him, all roads with you lead to Putin. <laughs> and and uh, that obviously is is an attack that really does get under his skin. And, and he called her a third rate politician. And Stanley Hoyer, who was there with her, uh, urged her to to walk out of the meeting, which which she did. But I asked her about this picture because I was really curious to know how she feels about this this new image she has. Right, as this sort of badass uh, lady, <laughs> with the, uh, you know, in, in all the memes and everything. Right. Uh, and I wanted to get her to reflect on that, but instead she just said isn't it amazing that the White House put out this photograph? <laughs> isn't it amazing that the president thought this was a good look for him? She said, he just does not understand what is not in his interest. <laughs> and so I thought it was so telling that her mind immediately went to strategy. She doesn't care about the image at all. She cares about the, the, the strategy of the whole thing. Yeah, well, we've talked a lot about her strengths. What's, what's her biggest weakness as a politician? What's her biggest weakness in Washington, her Achilles heel? Well, you know, she she can be a sort of rigid, not to say controlling person. You hear from House Democrats that although they admire the way she runs a very tight ship, she tends to micromanage in ways uh, big and small. You know, line edits every press release that goes out is a stickler for accuracy and detail in a way that uh, some people can find restrictive. And I honestly, I think that desire for, for control goes all the way back uh, to her childhood when... Uh, when she wasn't in control of her life and she saw how her mother wasn't in control of her life and she had these five older brothers who were always trying to protect her from the world and she wanted to be independent. She wanted to be in control. She wanted to have the, her own say over her own existence and and, and what she wanted to achieve. Um, so so I think most uh, most people in Congress, even some of her admirers would say that that is, is a weakness of hers. And then no, she's not. She's not going to be remembered as as one of uh, history's great political orators. She's not known for her, uh, you know, incredible soaring uh, speeches that bring everybody to tears. Uh, she she her her aides will tell you she's actually come a long way when she first got to Congress and was very uncomfortable as a public speaker. Um, but you know, and it, when you you you've interviewed her and uh, uh, I'm sure you've experienced this, she she tends to sort of repeat a lot of the same talking points. All politicians do that. Uh, from what I from what I understand, for for her, that's almost like a a form of self discipline uh, because she is one of these people whose whose brain tends to run ahead of their mouth, right? And so right. if she doesn't keep herself very very strictly on message, uh, she's apt to to wander off a little bit. Uh, but she also, again, she she cares about results more than she cares about what people thought of whatever speech she's giving. So she wants to drive that point home. And if that means repeating Republican tax scam 150 times in the space of five minutes, just so you'll get the point, uh, she's going to do that. She's going to drive the point home and make sure everybody gets it, uh, regardless of that, of whether that makes for, you know, a really uh, inspirational address. Yeah, a lot of folks want to know, what's her relationship with the younger members of Congress? Um, she's been there now for more than three decades. Uh, it's a different style. They're far more progressive. What, how, how is that working out for her? Yeah, well, you know, she has obviously uh, clashed with uh, the AOCs of the world and the squad, particularly in uh, the 2019 battle over border funding. Uh, but it's important to remember, A, that all four members of the squad voted for her for speaker, and I suspect they would do it again. Uh, the opposition to her in that leadership battle was mainly from the more conservative, moderate conservative members of the caucus who were tired of, you know, being attacked in their districts as a San Francisco liberal. Uh, she, she has always been the sort of the, the, the most progressive of the options uh, for speaker in that way. And then the other thing that I think is important to remember is that 
the, that 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 freshman squad is not representative of the congressional Democratic majority, even the younger generation. You know, the Democrats are in the majority today, uh, as Pelosi never tires of, of reminding people, uh, because of the moderates who won in tough districts. You know, uh, if a ham sandwich could have won that that AOC district. In, in New York had it had it defeated you know Joe Crowley in the primary right. uh, that was not a seat that got the Democrats to the majority it was all of the moderate to conservative members who ran on kitchen table issues who avoided you know left wing stances they are the reason that Democrats are in the majority so you know there's a lot of women particularly young women in the Democratic caucus she's very proud of that fact she has always tried to get more young women involved in politics. In fact, uh, the day after AOC won that primary, defeating Nancy Pelosi's close friend, Joe Crowley, right. Nancy Pelosi was on the phone to her saying, I'm so, I, I so appreciate your desire to make a difference. I'm so happy to have more young progressive women in Congress. So, uh, you know, she, uh, she's focused on getting those votes. Uh, and, and, and the squad, for all of its, uh, the attention that it gets, is not a formal caucus. It's not a group that, you know, they don't even tend to necessarily vote the same way. They're not, they haven't staked out a position in opposition to leadership. You don't see them going out there arguing to, to, to get rid of, of her, even if they're voting against her. And it's right. only four people. The Republicans, you know, the Republican speakers who preceded her had the, those uh, Freedom Caucus guys, at times dozens of members who were determined to make their lives difficult. Uh, and you can see that you can see how good Nancy Pelosi is at her job by the fact that that high profile group that that people see arrival to her, it's only four people. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, but is is her style is that is that Pelosi's old school style of politics, you know, calling constituents, keeping in touch, sending those notes to people uh, around the district. Remember, we're in an age of social media now. Does the squad do that? Is, is it a vestige? Is her style a vestige of the past? Um, is it over? Is she the last of the last to, to, to deploy that in terms of, uh, you know, uh, is it a whole new world now with regard yeah. to these younger well, men? You know, I, I, people have described her as an anachronism because of this type of old school politics so that, that, that she practices. Uh, I, I hope as an American that effective congressional leadership is not an anachronism, you know, I mean, uh, there isn't a lot of it to go around these days. Uh, and, uh, Again, the Republican speakers who, who immediately preceded her uh, uh, were not quite as good at things like keeping the government open, uh, which you would think was a pretty basic uh, thing that Congress has to do. Uh, so, so I think those, those aspects are, are things that, that a lot of politicians would be wise to emulate and that you do see a lot of politicians still today know how to do. Uh, she, and, and she absolutely still b believes in that. She does, she mentors younger people. She obviously has her favorites. You know, Adam Schiff is somebody that she very early on took a liking to and she's mentored him and, and, and encouraged him and pushed him uh, up the leadership ladder. Uh, she really liked Katie Hill uh, before Katie Hill uh, resigned uh, amid yeah. scandal. She, uh, she, you can see by, the, by who she picked as the impeachment managers who, some others of her favorites are uh, Val Demings from Florida, I think is a, a, a newer member, although she's not so young, uh, that, that, that Pelosi thinks has the potential to be really effective. Uh, so so I, think, I think a lot of these skills are timeless. Uh, a lot of people wanting to know, so what comes next for her? You're mentioning some of the names and, and members that she has favored. Um, first of all, will she, what happens uh, in the election? Uh, if it's Biden, if it's Trump, does she stay on? Does she give up the gavel? Does she stay stay in the, in the job? What, what's your sense on that, Molly? So I have no idea, and I don't make predictions, and it isn't <laughs> something that she talks about. It gets quite prickly when you bring it up. She'll uh, accuse <laughs> yeah. you of ageism and sexism and everything else for even right. mentioning it. And why don't you don't go ask Mitch McConnell? He's also getting right. up there in years. Uh, she claims that you know you have to take off. 20, her, she points out that her political career is about 20 years shorter than her male contemporaries because she didn't start till she was finished raising her children. Uh, that is not actually how chronological age works. You don't get to just subtract 20 because you yeah, it's, right, it's true. Uh, but uh, but but so you know she doesn't want to lame duck herself. Understandably, she is the election and and that's all she'll say about the potential for 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 her retirement. But you know something that I reported in the had not previously been reported. Uh, when she went through that leadership battle in 2018, 
and finally made a deal with the, uh, the, the moderates in the caucus to get her the votes to, on the floor to be speaker again, uh, the deal she accepted was a, a term limit that would mean that she would have to. Uh, and after accepting that condition, she walked into her next meeting and described it as sort of a fake concession. She said, well, I was planning on leaving after two years. So to have four years, they just gave me something and they don't even know it. And uh, this is a common uh, negotiating tactic of hers is to, and of, of a lot of effective negotiators, right? Pretend you're making a really painful concession when actually you're not giving up anything that you even did. Um, so, so at least at the time that she became speaker again in, in 2019, she was thinking of this as potentially her last does she still think of it that way? I have no idea. What happened since then? Uh, impeachment and everything else. Uh, if Trump wins again, it, would she would she stay on? You know, feeling like nobody else has the ability to stand up to him and keep the Democrats united. I really don't know. Uh, and uh, you know, I, I wouldn't be too surprised if she decided to hang on. Uh, and I don't know what else she would do, honestly. I mean, she she keeps <laughs> such a punishing schedule. She's so consumed by her work. Uh, she loves spending time with her grandchildren, but uh, it's hard for me to imagine her being a, a full-time nana. So, uh, so who knows? What, what's her relationship with Joe Biden? You know, I'm, I, I don't think they know each other extremely well. They all know each other in the same circles. And he, and she was speaker under Obama, so they dealt with each other a lot. Uh, but he was always sort of the Senate whisperer. When he went to Congress in 1972, he went straight into the Senate. He was never in the House. Uh, when Obama uh, dispatched him to help with congressional negotiations, it was usually the Senate that he dealt with, making deals with Mitch McConnell and so on. Uh, sometimes deals that uh, the Democrats in the, in the House caucus thought he gave away too much. Uh, so, yeah. She and I have had several conversations about the 2020 election. Uh, in fact, just today I interviewed her. And uh, she has always urged Democrats to nominate someone who for college win those battleground states. She definitely believes taking, you know, running to, toward the middle, not the left. Yeah. Uh, she never explicitly said, I don't think it should be Bernie Sanders, uh, but she was, was advocating for uh, a, a nominee that she felt could speak to middle America and to the voters that, that, that Democrats. And she, uh, even though she is advocated uh, for single-payer health care and for the public option in Obamacare. Uh, she didn't think that Democrats should adopt uh, Medicare for All as their big campaign platform. She believed that if you talk about taking away people's health care coverage, even if you're promising to give them something better, they're going to see that as, 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 as a loss, as disruptive, as, as menacing is the word that she used. So, uh, so I think he is the type of nominee that she uh, was talking about. Now, I think she also would very much like to see a woman become president. And she was uh, very devastated by Hillary Clinton's uh, loss, uh, in part because she likes Hillary Clinton and voted for her, but in part because she really would like to see a woman be president. Um, and that's obviously not going to happen this time either. Uh, but she does applaud uh, Biden's pledge to, to put a woman on the ticket as his running. Uh, you did, does she have any favorites among those VP? Uh, potentials, Kamala Harris, maybe? So when I asked her that question today, <laughs> oh, good. it was such a classic Pelosi response. She said, you think I'm going to tell you that? <laughs> <laughs> so she's not going to tell me that. Probably not going to tell you either. Uh, she has previously mentioned uh, Val Demings. I think she always likes to spotlight House members who are who are in the mix. Uh, just, and that's as, ca you know, caucus management as much as anything on her part. Uh, so she did not uh, lay her cards out to me beyond that, uh, but she said that she thinks that uh, the lists that she's seen, she thinks Biden has a lot of great options. Uh, my interview with her, by the way, is airing tomorrow as part of the Time 100 Talks. Got to give a little uh, okay. plug to uh, my employer there. Uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, but yes, uh, she she's not who her favorites are, but she's she's happy that we're going to see what she, it was funny to actually that we, we talked about Geraldine Ferraro a little bit earlier. And uh, when I brought up the VP search, she immediately went back to that moment in 1984 on the convention floor when Geraldine Ferraro officially became the vice presidential nominee, a fellow Italian-American 
woman Catholic and how and how her heart soared and how so many women Democrats uh, felt about that. So uh, yeah. so she very much thinks back to that moment when she thinks about having a woman yeah. on the ticket. Yeah. yeah, I was there in San Francisco when that happened. I, so definitely for as an Italian American, I get that too. One, one, we have time for a couple, just a couple more questions. Uh, you mentioned she goes more toward the center than the left a lot of times with her own, even with her own party on the issue of Black Lives Matter and defund the police. This seems to be a very thorny issue for Democrats right now. How is she navigating that or? Well, uh, I asked her that question three times and she did not answer it directly any time. Uh, she talks, but I think, you know, I've, I've interviewed several uh, high ranking Democrats on this question recently and, and they seem to have settled on a sort of talking point that is, well, we need to fund other things. But like, let's not talk about getting rid of law, law enforcement, but let's talk about all the funding that we need to put into services and mental health and so on and so forth. So that's not going to satisfy uh, the progressive activists who think that it's defund or nothing. Uh, but it, it is kind of ironic that this woman who has been, you know, the icon of the far left wing, right, in all these Republican ads as this like wild eyed liberal, uh, she's now seen as, as, as sort of a moderating force in her yeah. own caucus where you know progressives have been so empowered in recent years, it's funny that she would be the one sort of dragging the party back to the center. And, and quickly, uh, we saw yesterday in Georgia, incredible voting problems. Uh, male voting is a very big issue in California. Is she gonna be out front on that one? Uh, are Democrats worried? Is Pelosi worried uh, about disenfranch disenfranchisement of voters around the country? Is she gonna be a voice on that? Yeah, absolutely. And 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 uh, it's another thing that uh, we talked about in my interview today, not to keep going back to that, uh, but you clearly have thought of the smartest questions because these are all the questions that I ask. Uh, <laughs> uh, but no, I mean, look, she has repeatedly uh, included uh, funding for mail voting uh, and national mail voting in the coronavirus relief packages. Uh, she's very concerned about voter suppression. And that was what she talked about when I brought that up. Uh, at the same time, it is it is uh, a, an aspect of these bills that she has repeatedly let go in the negotiations with the Republicans. So is she as committed to that as she is to other sort of must must do non negotiable items in these negotiations? It would seem that she is not. Uh, whether that's just a matter of pragmatism, she knows they'll never go for it, or because it's not as important to her as other things like unemployment. I don't know that. Um, but it is an issue that she's focused on and concerned about. Okay, we have time for one last question. What do you think has been her greatest contribution to American politics, uh, Molly? Well, as I said, she would like her legacy to be the Affordable Care Act. And I think she was instrumental in that and she should be remembered as part of the history of, you know, for all of its, its shortcomings. And it's ironic that, you know, we're in this political moment where the Affordable Care Act is popular for the first time in its existence. And yet all Democrats want to talk about is how it doesn't go far enough and isn't good enough and we need to go further. Uh, but, uh, but, but it is a form of universal, it's, it's the first ever you know, universal guarantee of access to healthcare coverage in American history. She's very proud of that, I think deservedly so. Don't ask, don't tell, uh, environment, other uh, issues. Uh, her, she sees uh, she sees climate change as her, her her biggest sort of piece of unfinished business. The House passed a cap and trade bill on her watch in 2009. Didn't go far enough for a lot of people in the environmental community. In fact, Greenpeace refused to endorse it. It is still the only major climate legislation to pass a House of Congress. So you see there her pragmatism. She'd always rather take that half a loaf, take that baby step on an issue she cares about, even if it doesn't go as far as she would like. And then, you know, the legacy she leaves uh, as the first woman speaker, I think is really important. She broke that, that, that marble ceiling, still the first woman, still the only woman ever to, to lead a party in Congress. Uh, that, that she really had to fight to achieve that when she first put her name in the running to, to go for leadership. The, the male house power structure said, well, who said she could run? Yeah. And when, she, when that word got back to her, she was infuriated by the idea that she should need anybody's permission. And she, and she said, well, that just lights my fire. She <laughs> takes that, that as motivation. Um, and then her effectiveness. You know, you, um, you mentioned my description as, uh, you know, the most effective legislator since LBJ. That's not that's just my opinion. That's, I'm not a political scientist or a historian, but a lot of people who are say that she ranks up there with LBJ, with Sam Rayburn, with the great 
legislative leaders of history. And not only has she done it, you know, in the Ginger Rogers mold backwards and in heels, uh, uh, but she's done it at a time of, of unprecedented congressional dysfunction, right? At a time when it's it's harder than ever. Uh, it's partisanship, which she's arguably contributed to, but partisanship, polarization, the, the, the negative nature of politics, she has still found ways to get things done. And I think that that's really remarkable and people will remember that. And in four inch heels, we may add. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I wanna congratulate you for such a great read. Uh, it's a great book, I highly recommend it. And uh, we, we have to thank Molly Ball, national political correspondent for Time Magazine today. Listen, we encourage you to pick up your copy of Molly's book, Pelosi, through your local independent store. Many thanks to all of you who have joined us online today. I'm Carla Marinucci, and this virtual program of the Commonwealth Club is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you, Carla, and thanks everyone for coming.